it is my pleasure to announce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Fortune from uh, Boscom Palmer USA, who will give you a presentation on how more options in fluidics can benefit from complex cases. Thanks, Peter, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Dork, for sponsoring, and thank you all for being here. So I was asked to talk a little bit about fluidics in general, and uh, I was asked to talk about how fluidics matter in challenging cases, but I, and I will show you some challenging cases, but I think what I should uh, really talk about is why fluidics matter in all cases, and particularly at the end of this, why having a platform that allows you to choose and customize your fluidic settings uh, will deliver, uh, hopefully, greater ease of surgery and better outcomes for your patients. So every time I talk to my residents or fellows about fluidics, they get that look on their face. And really, fluidics is not as boring as you think. And if you understand fluidics, you can really apply it. And I think our colleagues across the, the uh, convention center here over on the anterior segment side have a much better understanding than we do as retina surgeons in general. Um, but physics can be applied to, uh, applied to practice. And as I said, manipulating fluidic parameters as the Dork Eva allows you to do uh, can improve the ease of surgery and as well as your surgical outcomes. So my fellows tell me that people put on their Facebook status, it's complicated. Well, fluidics is kind of complicated as well. And part of the issue is that you have all these different uh, parameters that at the end of the day really affect two things, flow rates and vitro-retinal traction. And we care about those two things because at the end of the day, what really matters is not only the ease of our surgery, which is efficiency, but how safe our surgery is. And I'd like to show you how fluidics affect both of those things. So we talk about vitreous flow, and a lot of this is about vitreous flow. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. And vitreous flow is defined as the volume removed per unit time. And as I mentioned before, it impacts efficiency and it impacts safety. And you have to understand two basic principles about flow, uh, that it can be controlled by your console, okay, by your machine, and then also at the level of the port, which is a term that uh, Steve Charles coined. And I'll briefly talk about those two, and I'll show you how the Dork Eva uh, allows console-based control that is unprecedented uh, with any other uh, platform right now on the market. So I won't bore you too long with this, but you're aware of Peristaltic and Venturi. I think uh, you, my European colleagues, are more familiar with Peristaltic uh, machines, which uh, have not really been used in the posterior segment uh, uh, arena in the United States. Uh, but we know that Peristaltic allows for flow control, uh, Vacuum and flow in a peristaltic machine are independent. However, there's always been issues with pulsatile flow, and pulsatile flow in the posterior segment is not something we want because we don't want pulsating retina or vitreous. Venturi pump uh, consoles allow for rapid and responsive vacuum control, and that's something that we want in order to uh, uh, increase efficiency, be able to manipulate tissues uh, quickly, but there's occlusion break issues. So. Neither system in and of itself is an ideal platform, if you will, for console-based flow control. Quickly, if we talk about port-based flow, port-based flow becomes important if your platform does not allow you to control flow directly at the level of the platform, and you need to use other parameters such as cut rate and lumen size and uh, some of these other things to sort of manipulate flow, and that's how some other platform systems do this. Obviously, we know that the smaller a gauge is, the less flow you're going to get through that gauge. And then, I won't get too much into it, but cut rates and duty cycle. You may hear a lot about duty cycle control and duty cycle manipulation. Understand that once you get above a certain cut rate, the duty cycle is 50-50. That doesn't matter, okay? And understand that in general, in general, the faster you cut, the less flow you're going to get. That's not exactly true because vitreous is a non-Newtonian fluid. Uh, but in general, faster cut rates, though we, we want that for safety, and we'll talk about that in a second, lead to decreased flow. And when you combine faster cut rates and smaller ports, you can get significantly decreased flow. And I'll show you again how the Dork Eva, not only with uh, flow control, but also with the TDC cutter, obviates both of these factors. 
So let's talk about what's innovative about the Dork Eva, and it's a system called VacuFlow VTI. And really what it provides is the best of both worlds for both peristaltic and Venturi pump systems. It's technically called a linear displacement system, and it consists of pistons and time valves. And as I said, it's a hybrid system. And you can see here that it gives you not only a faster rise time than a traditional Venturi pump, so it, gives, it improves on the Venturi system, but also it is, gives you less pulsatile flow than a peristaltic system. So not only does it combine the best of both Venturi and peristaltic uh, uh, pump systems, but it improves on both uh, in significant ways. Very quickly, why do we want faster cut rates? Well, this may seem obvious to some of you, but for those of you who are not aware, we want faster cut rates because faster is always safer. The issue we've always had with cutting faster is that faster is less efficient, and that's because the faster you cut, the decrease in your duty cycle, and the less flow you get through your cutter. But ideally, you'd always like to be cutting at a faster rate. And that's where the TDC biblade cutter, um, um, or the TDC cutter from Dork comes in, because it allows you to cut effectively at 16,000 cuts per minute. Understand that it cuts both in the downward and upward direction, so technically your cut rate is 8,000 cuts per minute, but effectively uh, it is 16,000 cuts per minute. And you can see here that with a classic cutter, you get all this traction, uh, or all this movement, and you can see, comparatively speaking, how much smoother things are here and how much faster it is. So it gives you the, sa the safety of cutting at 16,000 cuts per minute without sacrificing any efficiency. And you can see here that whereas traditional cutters have a decrease in flow as cut rates increase, you can see that we get a consistent maintainable flow rate even at 16,000 cuts uh, with the TDC cutter. For most efficient vitreous removal, your vacuum is going to go up, and your cut rate is usually in this 3D mode that other machines have, your cut rate's going to go down. Okay? And then when you switch to shave mode, what happens is they basically just put you on a high cut rate and you just alter your vacuum, so that's proportional vacuum. The EVA is different. The EVA really does control flow, so your core setting is your traditional proportional vacuum mode. So you're constantly at 8,000 or 16,000 cuts per minute, and your vacuum varies based on your foot pedal. So this allows for great efficiency of vitreous removal because you have that TDC cutter that's open 92% of the time, okay? And you have the Venturi pump-like mechanism that allows you to raise your vacuum very quickly and allows for efficient vitreous removal. And then this is where things uh, actually get very nice, and I'll show you some videos to demonstrate this, which is the quote-unquote shape settings or flow control mode, which is really a unique system to the Dork EVA. You can see here that when I'm in flow mode, I have a lower and an upper parameter. And what it allows us to do is set an upper limit on our treadle of how high we want the flow to go. So no matter how hard I press on that pedal or how far down I press that pedal, my flow will not increase higher than 2.9 cc's per minute. And what this allows me is that it gives me incredible control when I'm operating close to the retina or in detached retina. And I'll tell you that I have multiple flow settings depending on what kind of work I'm doing. Also, as somebody who trains fellows, uh, it's actually a great sort of uh, uh, training wheel aid when they're operating on uh, regmatogenous detachments. So understand that flow in other systems is sort of indirectly controlled in many ways, uh, not only by cut rate and by controlling vacuum. Here with this system, you can directly manipulate the amount of flow, then, and that's very, very useful from a surgical clinical standpoint, and I'll show you a couple of videos. So let's go to the videos here. So this is, I'll start off by showing you some cases of regmatogenous detachments. You can see here we have a regmatogenous detachment, and you can see that we are now sort of in our core mode, and you can see the retina is moving. And what I'm going to show you in subsequent frames here is how I lower my flow mode, and you can see now that I'm, as I'm aspirating and cutting, and I'm lowering it and continuously lowering it, 
and the retina will start moving less and less and less to the point where I can actually cut vitreous directly over detached retina, and you can see how little movement is actually present here, even as I'm cutting right at the edge of the tear. When you combine that with scleral depression, clearly, you makes for a very, very stable retina. And this is another case of regmatogenous retinal detachment. Here I'm using the Dork dual chandelier system, which I find quite useful um, in cases where I may not have skill depression and I want to depress for myself as I shave the vitreous base. And again, here we are in sort of vacuum mode. You can see there's movement to the retina. And then as we approach detached retina, you can see we lower the flow and you can see actually how we are now shaving directly over detached retina and how little that retina is moving. Let me show you that again. When you combine that again with scleral depression, which in this case I can do for myself because I have chandeliers in, uh, again, it creates for a very stable retina. Let me go ahead and laser the tear. Good. Can we advance can we advance to the next? All right, great. Here we go. So the last two cases I'll show you are how I use flow mode in diabetic cases. Um, this is a somewhat simple tractional retinal detachment. I'm now doing this with 27 gauge. Um, I'll obviously let uh, Dr. Stallman talk more about this, but one of the advantages of the TDC cutter is its increased efficiency, which has really allowed us to do efficient 27 gauge surgery, which I think is what's held a lot of people back from doing true 27 gauge surgery uh, with other platforms is the, is the inefficiency of 27 gauge systems. Um, but one of the nice things about flow mode in diabetics is that you can lower the flow mode and almost use this as, uh, use your, your cutter really as a scissors, uh, which a lot of us are doing already to segment it with the cutter alone. But especially when you're dealing with underlying atrophic retina or underlying uh, retina that may be mobile, it's not always easy to delaminate uh, those segmented pegs because of the movement of the underlying retina. And you could see how easily, um, how easily and how nicely controlled that plaque came off. I then can switch immediately back to vacuum mode to get the nice suction that I want in order to induce that vitreous detachment there and then for efficient peripheral vitreous removal. So again, it's all about having options and not using the same type of tool, if you will, or the same type of settings for every surgical procedure, which is what, what you, you have to sometimes do with other vitrectomy systems. I think the EVA really gives you a nice control uh, to really tailor your fluidics to each particular case. And I'll finish here with a very complicated uh, uh, tractional, combined tractional and regmatogenous retinal detachment, which I just did about a week ago. Uh, and this is a patient where the entire retina had been chronically detached and had developed tractional detachment too from diabetes. And so you're gonna see me remove some of this pre-retinal proliferation and understand that the underlying retina is completely detached. The hyaloid is flat. In these cases, I like to use viscodissection to create a potential space between the detached retina and the fibrovascular membranes. And we can also bluntly dissect, but as we inject, so we're injecting viscoelastic to separate the tissues, but now I'm in flow mode at a very low setting, and you can see that I am not only segmenting, but then delaminating these membranes and that retina underneath is completely detached and completely mobile. And you can see that at no point does it ever really jump up into my cutter. 
And that's because my flow mode is set very low there. I think probably less than less than 2.5. And so it really allows me to use it more like a scissors and then remove the tissues. At some point, the view started getting uh, a little bit hazy here for me. So I'll just show you one other advantage of the TDC cutter uh, is that we were able to quickly remove we were able to quickly remove this lens even using a, a 27 gauge cutter. And then we're able to get back to our dissection. So I realized when I put this in that being in a country like Austria where you have excellent beer, nobody drinks anything like Miller Lite, but in the United States there's a very popular beer that tastes like water called Miller Lite, and their ad was always great taste or less filling, and you, the whole point of the ad is that you couldn't have both. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, if we're looking for safety and efficiency, uh, the Dork Eva gives you the ability to have both without compromise. Uh, I think that having a high cut rate and direct flow control increases safety, but also the TDC cutter allows for more efficient vitreous removal at high cut rates, and it makes small gauge vitrectomy, even 27 gauge vitrectomy, as Peter will tell you, uh, uh, plausible and possible. Thank you. So the next presentation is by myself, and I would like to give you an update on 27-gauge uh, surgery. Um, these are my financial disclosures. I just would like to quickly know who uses 27-gauge here? By a raise of hands, so not so many of you, actually. Okay, uh, quickly, um, the history about the gauge. Uh, it all started 20 gauge uh, already a long time ago. Uh, the first attempt to go uh, transconjunctival was 25 gauge, uh, which had some very huge limitations at that time in 2001, uh, after which Klaus Eckert introduced the 23 gauge system, which became very popular, and now the latest uh, downsize is 27 gauge. Um, I've borrowed some slides from Gurav Shah. Um, who did a uh, questionnaire on the use of 27 gauge, and it was actually quite interesting. Um, there was a questionnaire from 40 centers uh, distributed over the US and Europe, and it shows that a year ago, over half of the 27 gauge users were only using um, the, this 27 gauge in a minority of cases. And now, a year later, um, the surgeons who use 27 gauge are using it now in at least 50% of their cases. So there's a learning curve. I had the same learning curve when I started using 27 gauge. In the beginning, it was limited to macular surgery only. Uh, now uh, we use it, and all my coworkers use it in about 60%, uh, 70% uh, of cases. Um, and uh, it shows that in three years' time, uh, from being a niche, uh, 20, uh, how 27 gauge was, that is now becoming more uh, mainstream as an application. And still, uh, it's mainly used for macular surgery. Um, and I, I couldn't agree more. Um, if you need um, to use silicon oil, do uh, fluid air exchanges, uh, more complicated cases, I think there's still, of course, room for uh, larger gauge. I personally use either 27 gauge as a standard and uh, in uh, more difficult cases or where I use silicone or whatever, I go to 23. For me, it's a perfect uh, combination. And so Gurov's uh, study can be summarized that um, the surgeons using 27 gauge for in more than half of the case, cases has doubled in one year. Uh, it's mainly used for macular surgery, but of course there's room for improvement. Instrument rigidity, illumination, etc., uh, can be improved. So I would like to give you an overview of um, how companies, uh, including Dork, of course, are working in improving the quality of the 27 gauge uh, surgery. And the first is a new thinking of how instruments are being designed. Uh, earlier. Um, uh, companies took the shape of, for example, a 20 gauge forceps, and when it had to be uh, made smaller, like 27 gauge, they simply reduced it in size. But then you end up with very tiny uh, instruments uh, which lacked the necessary uh, grip. 
uh, and so this process was re completely rethought and um, 27 gauge instruments are now more being designed to the shape um, of uh, large size instruments. And this, for example, shows you uh, side to side a 23 gauge end gripping forceps and a 27 gauge end, end gripping forceps on, in, on the right side. And when I rotate them sideways, you will see that there's no difference anymore. So they're really using now the maximum opening of the 27 gauge opening of your trocar in order to make these instruments. So you can have the same grip uh, at the tip. Also there is an um, optimizing of the tips of the instrument. For example, this is the optimized end gripping forceps uh, where you have even better adhesion uh, of tissue at the tips. And also new, new steel alloys are being used. Uh, look how the newly designed instrument bends a lot less than the old one. It's very obvious here when I uh, push both the old and the new type against each other how the newer type is much more sturdy than before. Um, it's actually now difficult to feel the difference in stiffness between a 23 and a 27 gauge uh, forceps. Um, and so this shows you um, a typical 27 gauge uh, ILM peeling. Um, where it's hard to tell if the tip of the forceps is 23 gauge or 27 gauge. Um, also, the, like the light fiber and other instruments have a reinfo reinforced instrument base. And of course that helps a lot in uh, preventing bending of the instrument. We use our uh, light pipe uh, also as a way to turn the eye in the desired position. So we need to be able to generate enough force without bending of the instrument and this reinforced base really helps there. Curved instruments are also possible. For example, this is the 27 gauge uh, laser fiber from Dork. It's uh, slightly curved and uh, that way you can introduce it easily uh, through the 27 gauge cannula and reach the far periphery that you want to laser as is shown here. So also there solutions uh, were found. And even in more complex cases such as this diabetic case, uh, you can even work by manually. Scissors are available in 27 gauge, um, so you can do even complex cases um, if you want uh, with this very small size, as also Dr. Uh, Fortune has just uh, demonstrated us. Um, also, there are some clever solutions to improve uh, back flush. For example, this is, uh, and I really like this one, this is an optimized 27 gauge. Um, silicone tipped uh, back flush instrument and uh, instead of gluing a very small um, silicone tube into the inner lumen of the 27 gauge uh, needle they found a way to make the size of the tip uh, almost the same size as the instrument itself and this provides a really really good even passive back flush in 27 gauge. How about fluidics? Well uh, I can refer to the previous speaker of course uh, I just would like to add that um, if you use 27 gauge, you should use a high speed infusion line that is shown here. Instead of fitting in the uh, instrument cannula, you will see that the infusion line fits over the instrument cannula. Um, that's why it's called high, fusion, high speed infusion because you use the full diameter of this uh, cannula. And actually the flow in this high speed 27 gauge um, uh, instrument cannula is better than the standard infusion in 23 gauge because it creates less turbulence. So the flow is not really an issue anymore. And again, we keep repeating it, the TDC cutter, the two-dimensional cutter is a major uh, advantage. It's, I started doing 27 gauge as a routine when this cutter arrived. This really makes a difference. Um, a 27 gauge surgery doesn't have to take more time than a 23 gauge uh, if you use this cutter. Um, also, illumination um, is uh, prone to uh, improvement um, and you can um, also as an alternative use the twin light chandelier, also Dr. Fortune alluded to this, this is quite convenient uh, if you want to have uh, bimanual surgery. Um, but I would not recommend it to use it as a routine in all 27 gauge cases because then you need to make two more holes in the eye. But uh, Dork now has come out with an enhanced light fiber uh, in 27 gauge which provides you 80% more output. And uh, this of course 
um, will make a big difference um, in our 27 gauge uh, cases. Now, what are the advantages of uh, going 27 gauge? Well, first of all, uh, since we work to much smaller openings, we uh, reduce uh, the vitreous incarceration and we reduce that way the likelihood of having anterior loop traction. Um, also, there's a very fast wound closure and if you haven't tried, you really should. It's incredible at the end of the surgery that you just pop out the three uh, cannulas and that's all you need to do. Uh, in 23 gauge, I often have to do this maneuver, um, but normally in 27 gauge, uh, I don't even have to rub the sclerotomies anymore. Uh, as you can see when I'm showing them, these incisions are completely closed. Uh, it's even rare, very rare, that I even need to inject some additional BSS or air bubble at the end. Usually I just have to take out the cannulas and uh, the incisions are closed. Um, also, um, the uh, faster post-op recovery. Every surgeon that I speak to that uses 27 gauge in combination with 25 or 23 will always tell me, yes, we know for sure that this uh, 27 gauge leads to faster post-op recovery. But of course, that's only a subjective feeling. Uh, we can all claim this, but there's no hard evidence. And that's why I'm uh, very glad that I can, but well, this is an example of a patient, the morning after 27 gauge surgery, the pupil is still dilated. That tells you which eye was operated. And even when the patient opens the eye, it's very hard to see that the eye was operated. And this is not an exception. This is the typical appearance of a 27 gauge uh, case the day after. Um, I've told this story before you might have heard it, but I think more than a year ago, I overheard a conversation between two residents who had to do the rounds of the patients the next day. And I heard them saying, well, uh, tomorrow on Saturday we'll have to see again like 12 patients, but he did 10 of them 27 gauge, so they will all be fine. Uh, so that's how the residents even saw the difference between the uh, larger gauge surgery and the smaller gauge uh, surgery. Um, but we will do a clinical trial um, to really prove uh, our point that 27 gauge leads to better outcomes. Um, first, we will start uh, a test uh, trial in, in my center um, and we will look at patients the day after the surgery being performed either 23 gauge or 27 gauge and we will look at parameters such as surgery time, the action that we require to close the sclerotomies and also look at um, post-op parameters that uh, we think uh, matter, uh, things like pain, discomfort, the reddishness of the eye, the glare in the anterior chamber, and how the patients feel afterwards. And we hope to extend this afterwards into a multi-center trial to really prove our point that uh, 27 gauge outperforms uh, the rest. Thank you for your attention. Dear moderators, dear colleague, uh, okay. as you know, there is a, a rapid adoption of smaller gauge. We observe rapid adoption of smaller gauge with tractum on a global scale over the last several years. The answer given us this question on last year past survey uh, uh, support these rapid adoptions, and uh, we can say that only less than 10% of surgeon on global scale did not try the smaller gauge surgery. However, the, in my practice, the most annoying problem with 27 gauge, 23 and 25 gauge surgery is wound instability. And I need uh, straightion in most of the cases. Uh, uh, as you know, naturally, regarding wound instability, much smaller is uh, much better. Uh, the most uh, important advantage of small, uh, 27 gauge is the wound stability, almost no need of suture in my practice. So as you know, uh, 27 gauge uh, surgery is uh, pre uh, presented almost seven years ago by Oshima and Tano. However, the adoption of to 27 gauge is not as fast as 23 and 25 gauge. And again, the answer given to this question, uh, as you see here, almost 70% of surgeons in the world did not try this surgery yet. Only less than 3% can apply this surgery, more than 60% of their daily practice. 
So why? What's the reason? So I started using transverse engage surgery almost five years ago, and today, uh, most of uh, more than 70% of my patients, I apply transverse engage surgery. So in my experience, the most prominent pro prominent problem was the flexibility of instruments. It had uh, been largely eliminated, but today it has been largely eliminated with new generation instruments. So one of these extended to reach wide grip forceps, which is designed by Dr. Paulides. Uh, it has 40% uh, increase and has stiffness comparing with the 27 gauge end gripping forceps. It has a wide gripping uh, area uh, for, to reduce number of grasp action and minimize risk of retinal uh, trauma. So we can apply this uh, to peel uh, macular uh, retinal membrane and ILM also more safely than the end gripping forceps because the rigidity is really significantly increased and you can uh, peel the membrane with less manipulations and with less trauma on the macular area. And also in diabetic patients, when they increase the rigidity, it's because I know all the story of 27 gauge from the beginning to now, and the rigidity is now is really increased, and you can peel a uh, membrane, and you can bend the eye through the left and right and out of the major vascular arcade uh, with this uh, new forceps. Uh, and also the grasping uh, force is uh, much better than the uh, current uh, 27 gauge uh, forceps. This, another one is ultra peel forceps. Also, it's uh, designed for single movement peeling of membranes and blunt round tip design and increased shaft stiffness also provides precise control of smaller gauge uh, surgery. So if the membrane is elevated, you can uh, directly apply uh, ultra peel forceps and peel it with a few attempts. but if it's perfectly attached like LM, it's difficult to start to peel in a limiting membrane with this forceps because it's blunt and round edge is not allowed that. Uh, and I apply this uh, forceps in macular hole surgery. This patient has been operated by myself in uh, some life surgery a few months ago. And this is large macular hole. I usually uh, use PFCL to prevent hole uh, from the dying attachment from the toxicity. So during this injection aspiration, I do not close the infusion. I keep the infusion uh, open. As you see, there is no turbulence. So this, I noticed that in 27 gauge, the turbulence in the vitreous cavity during injection of dye and aspiration is much less than the others. And therefore, you can inject the dye only the macular area, you can aspirate it. So Again, Brilliant Blue is really perfectly stained ILM. If there's the surface ILM is intact, it's bare. But you see here, there is negative staining that the retinal membrane is here, and the other is bare ILM. So in this patient, I apply, perform a temporal inverted PLEP. First, I use end creeping forceps to make a temporal circle. And then I use uh, ultra peel forceps to be able to peel temporal ILM flap without tearing, without breaking, because it's important to keep a block of ILM peel and to invert to the macular area for the large macular hole. This patient is 950 microns macular hole. As you see, only two manipulations, two attempts, and we can manage to peel the enemetic uh, membrane. Then I use PFCL to keep uh, inverted flap attached on the macular area, but you see there is folding here. So under PFCL, with passive section of back flash needle, you can uh, get unfolding of ILM. So I like that because if you keep the ILM is, uh, unfolding uh, on the macular area, you can obtain perfect macular configuration after surgery. Then I apply fluid air exchange, and first remove the fluid, and then up, uh, you remove the PFCL. When you go to the edge of the PFCL bubble, when you remove all fluid and uh, enlarge the bubble because of the hydrophobic uh, specialty, when you remove the uh, fluid, it's enlarged. And this is the key point that during this session, we should pay attention to dry the macula as much as possible. And just after surgery, uh, usually perform local anesthesia and keep the patient, turn the patient positions to the right and the left side to prevent accumulation of fluid to the macular area to return of the flap uh, during uh, surgery. And therefore, this patient has been operated under general anesthesia and therefore I couldn't manage the early post period and the patient was still uh, lying face up position an hour after surgery. And therefore, we get not uh, successful results. The macular hole is still open. And as you see, it's the same size as previous. 
and they did second surgery. I just stained the ILM. As you see, the ILM is inverted in its original place. It's attached strongly again, but there's one difference between the previous one. The circle, the temporal circle is enlarged, so there's retraction of the ILM uh, through the macular area. It's a little retraction like Dr. Tamir Mahmoud present this retraction door of ILM. Then applied again the ultra peel forceps to peel the membrane. So the second surgery with the new, uh, same forceps, you can manage to peel without tearing. This is very important. So the same procedure that I did. And after surgery, TVEC after surgery, this was previous before surgery, and macular holes get uh, very smaller, it's less than 200 micron. As you see, you can see the flap uh, covering the uh, macular hole area. And in this patient, we follow this patient and waiting to close the hole by itself in a few weeks after this time, uh, that time, because as Michaleska showed this in their original study, uh, which is the uh, inventor of this technique, and in this patient, the cellular proliferations continue, and a few weeks after, uh, then can co close by the steps completely. This is the only case, and I put more than 20 cases with large macular hole. This patient also has some uh, improvement of function, improvement in the macular area of OCT, uh, micropyrimetry. This is another patient, 800 micron, and you see completely close, how you can see this perfect configuration of macular hole after closing this. This is the way, uh, this is the reason that ILM, if you uh, uh, cover the ILM perfectly in the macular hole area, you can see this perfect macular configurations. This is another patient, again, 600 micron large hole, and after surgery, you see, it's, it's unbelievable. I didn't do this good macular configuration in my normal standard hole uh, surgery. And in this patient, we apply this multicolor uh, image. As you see, the folding of ILM you can see here. There's some folding, but it's inverted as a uh, green reflectance is shown much better. But when we look at the emphasis OCT uh, angiography, you can see the folding of ILM on the macular surface. On the temporal side, we can see uh, nerve fiber layer dissociations. So the other uh, instrument is new back flash needle. So the previous, the current back flash needle was not uh, uh, sufficient uh, for passive aspiration, and as, uh, active aspiration was necessary always. But the new one is, new design is much better, and it's effective. Uh, it has effective active and passive aspiration. It's slim line designed for easier movement and control, and reduced size of the handle, and less force required to active reservoir, and it has a larger reservoir. So this is an uh, unediting fluid air exchange with new active back flash. It takes only 10 seconds. So it's really uh, effectively you can do this. And also, uh, as you see in my previous video, you can uh, apply ac passive sections, as you see here, with a, a good control. So um, it's much better than the previous uh, uh, back flash uh, needles. So the other one is light, in problem is light intensity. The light intensity in 27 gauge light probe is not powerful. Therefore, in today, I use uh, extra light, like twin, uh, uh, twin lights. You usually use shielded total with an illumination probe together with twin light. So this video, now only the uh, total view is open, but when we uh, add the uh, twin light, as you see how it's uh, increased the in, uh, intensity of the light. And therefore, uh, in macular surgery, sometimes I need extra light. But the new probe, new 27-gauge uh, light uh, probe, is not available yet, but it will be uh, available in a few months later. And the light output increase about 60% uh, percent compared to new, the current 71, and it will be, I think, enough to do surgery only with, uh, without any extra lights. And finally, I will mention 41-gauge uh, subretinal cannula. It's a not new uh, instrument, but it uh, helped me, me to dry my complex case, cases. And uh, we use this uh, subretinal cannula in uh, subretinal injection. And this patient that I operate the last Frankfurt retina meeting uh, this year, and it was submacular hemorrhage, I use this uh, subretinal 4 to 1 gauge cannula for the give injection of TPA and also anti VEGF. It's really. Uh, a uh, very uh, non-invasive method. You can inject VGF, anti-VGF, or uh, as you see the injections. But for this patient, is the key point of surgery to uh, create enough retinal detachment to uh, give permission to the 
blood clots to displays from the macular area to the inferior part of the nose. As you see here, we uh, made a, a, enough retinal detachment area. That's very important. Otherwise, the TPA is not enough to liquefy all blood and only uh, release and only release the uh, attachment of the blood clot to the retina and those RPE when the blood clot is getting free and it can uh, go displaced to the inferior part of the retina. But if you create enough retinal detachment, the inferior part of the uh, retina, in case, depends the position of hemorrhage, of course. But usually, we prefer to make a detachment the inferior part of the retina as in other patients. And I applied this surgery. This is uh, before and after surgery of this patient picture. Do and also Dr. Efki, can I ask you to wrap up? Because I want to give Dr. Roman also the chance to give his presentation. Sure. I just finished. And this is massive uh, hemorrhage. And I applied the same surgery with these patients with the uh, same uh, technique. And, and uh, two weeks after the uh, surgery, you see this massive hemorrhage even displaced to the inferior part of the now. So in conclusion, 27-gauge vitrectomy system deserving the name of Stirling surgery in regards to stability and of sclerotomies. And uh, limitation related to flexibility of instruments and difficulty in aspiration with 27-gauge backflash needle are largely eliminated with new generation instruments. And new generation instruments gives the chance of more comfortable and safer surgery in our complex cases. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to accept this title for the presentation because I think this topic affects a lot the surgical, the functional outcomes of our surgery. And I think it's also underestimated. So the silicon oil biocompatibility does not mean just the silicon oil emulsion or creaming. This is a creaming, the emulsion, you cannot see the emulsion because there are just a few microns, the bubbles are just a few microns inside. But uh, the I mean, the toxicity is also retina toxicity. This is a three weeks after vitrectomy laser and oil for retina detachment and the perfluorocarbon liquid was not used before the surgery, during the surgery. That means just because of the oil. And uh, this is a, like a pale optic nerve. So we believe that also this finding is underestimated. This is a, after removal of silicon oil, sometimes it can happen, and we don't know why, uh, why but still, you know, the optic nerve is uh, not as was before the, um, the silicon oil tamponade. So, and also, you know, the sticky oil formation has been described about, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, and uh, probably, you know, a um, uh, few of you have had, you know, this kind of findings as well. And this is a retinal necrosis, and um, we, were, we are under, uh, now under oil, but uh, those happen under heavy silicon oil. And you can see this large tear because the BSS dropped just during the air fluid exchange, removing heavy silicon oil. And this is uh, six weeks after laser and normal oil. So there was already a retinal necrosis when we were removing the heavy silicon oil. So we will speak about the biocompatibility changes of silicon oil in presence of chemical energy. We will speak about something that uh, we can see we, we can add every day, so surfactants and impurity. Surfactants are compounds that lower the interfacial tension between two liquids. Surfactants are proteins that are characteristic of the patient and of the surgery. So if our surgery is not so clean, we add proteins that are surfactants. But there are also surfactants uh, in the silicon oil impurity. So that means are characteristic of silicon oil and characteristic of the packaging, so UV active substance. We we are just publishing this paper that when our surgery is not so clean, so the interfacial tension is a function of albumin concentration. So we had the, the 70 gram liters that's corresponding to the physiological serum con component of albumin, and we had a reduction of interfacial tension of 70%. That means is much more prone to emulsion, the silicon oil. But this, uh, you know, is related to the patient and to the, our surgery. We don't know something that is related to the compound that we are using. So the aim was to make sure about what we are currently using in our surgical practice and are all the relevant information labeled present in the package insert of the product that we are using. And what does 100% pure silicon oil mean? So silicon oil is uh, you know, a production that comes from a 
three step synthesizes, mainly polymerization. The 1000 silicon oil is a compound of about uh, 30,000 Dalton. But during the polymerization reaction are also generated short molecular components, so that are oligosiloxane and silanol. This is just a matter of dimension of the molecules. So the European Chemical Agency, just a few months ago in June this year, have been included in the low molecular waste component in the candidate list of substances of very high concern. And, but the, what are the, the company doing to reduce this low molecular weights component? Are doing a purification and ultra, ultra purification process from low molecular weights and short chain siloxane. And you know, it's a multiple step cleaning with control of gas chromatography. But uh, can we quantify really the low molecular weights component in the product that we are using? So this is an independent study. We just had the results a few weeks ago. The aim was uh, to compare the different silicon oil in terms of molecular weight distribution because uh, we have just seen this a matter of uh, the size of the chain. So we, we are looking just at the area under the tail of the curve on our left. So we want to see you know, how much low molecular weights components are present because we have seen that are the impurity and are responsible for many things. So t 10 different oils that are on the market. We were looking uh, to, you know, from uh, 30,000 Dalton to 200, you know, and we are looking at this area. So under the tail of the curve on the left, the short chain component. And these are the results. I think it's very important to know that, uh, you know, are not all the same. This is in the PPM. And you can see there are, this is the siloxane con concentration in the different oils that we are currently using. So the, the point now, I mean, this, uh, you know, we need to um, better see what does it mean, because uh, um, D4 and D6 are the low molecular weights component, but are only the minimal part of the impurity. If you can see, you can see that, uh, you know, the fraction of silicon oil that's under 10,000, because the real 1,000 is 35,000. So under 10,000 that we can still say that are low molecular weights component are between 1% and 8%. So it's a, a huge, um, and a huge part. So, and what do we know about, you know, the low molecular weights component less than 10,000? We know that they have a role on the protein denaturation. We know that the greater concentration of low molecular weights components are associated with increased protein denaturation and to the turbidity of the solution. So the first question, what is the, first of all, is the correlation of low molecular weights component with viscosity? Yeah, because the higher viscosity can have the low molecular weights component because uh, the chain is much longer. So the local remedies components can stay inside. And uh, then there is uh, any residual low molecular weights component left in the eye after the removal of silicon oil. Yes, the literature says they, they have a high diffusion cost, and so D4 mainly may diffuse from the silicon oil to the surrounding tissue. And the speculation is that the low molecular weights diffuse out of the oil in the ocular tissue, inducing chronic toxicity. So there is any relation then of the low, mole the low molecular weights, so the impurity with the inflammation. We need to look better on this topic, but for sure we know that the low molecular weights decrease the interfacial tension, increase the inflammation because of the phagocytosis of uh, this short chain by, you know, by RP, and then you know, they work as antigen presenting cell for the inflammatory response to the immunogenic agent. So now we are working on the correlation in vivo on cell line between the different sides of low molecular weights component and the inflammation and the biocompatibility lost. We need to remember it's not the problem is not, not just the oil itself, but also the interaction between oil and uh, perfluorocarbon liquid. So we know and uh, we publish that, uh, that when we remove the the perfluorocarbon liquid, we leave a lot of perfluorocarbon liquid, even if we do air fluid exchange, because the perfluorocarbon liquid stays on the retina wall. So, and uh, we also publish that uh, when you add the 
normal oil or heavy silicon oil, sometimes you can have the formation of this hyperviscous solution that can be also sticky. So the sticky oil comes from the interaction between perfluorocarbon liquid, even if it has been removed, and the silicon oil itself. And also the temperature affect this interaction. So what's happening, so this is uh, the main point that we need to keep in mind that, that uh, we have several factors that are playing a different role in this toxicity. But uh, in a few words, we need to spend also on the PFO. You know that uh, the Spanish Agency of Medicine and Medical Device declared an alert on PFO from Alamedics because in Spain, they, we had 120 cases of uh, no light perception because of the day after the surgery, because of the PFO. And uh, the findings were a pale optic nerve, retinal necrosis, disruption of all layers. So the Alamedics uh, exhibited certification of safety and was based on this extract cytotoxicity test. So according to the ISO, it was not toxic. Yoba and Pastor did the same experiment with a different test, was a direct contact test, still according to the ESO and was toxic. So why did the toxicity was not detect and are the ESO criteria adequate or not? So we went back and we did the, again the same experiment according to the ESO. The problem is that the ESO says that, that you can arbitrarily choose one type of test, but uh, the condition must be validated according to the use that we have to do of the device. So we need to know something about the PFO. And we know that uh, we cannot, the PFO is in contact with the retina. We cannot do the extract test, but mainly the direct test. So we did everything, you know, the, the experiment again. So we selected the a testing adequate test method. We did the risk assessment, you know, um, according to the critical phases of the test, and experimental design was managed to risk the failure. So, mm, uh, keeping in mind that the perfluorocarbon liquid is immiscible with water, has a specific gravity greater than water, volabi has volatility and transparency, we don't use, we didn't use the extract test and direct test, we used the direct contact test. And also, we really went deep inside with the risk assessment and also with experimental design. We know that the, the, there are six variables. So for the variability of the cell sensitivity with two different cellular lines, we, uh, we avoid the evaporation, so using a medium on the PFCL. We use uh, three different contact area, two, three different contact time, because I think uh, this issue was very important to address, and also, you know, positive and negative control. At the end, you know, we found according to the ISO that the cytotoxicity was in terms of quality and quantitative uh, viability aside in this term, so more than two in the cytotoxicity score and more than 30% of uh, relative cell mortality. And what we found that, uh, you know, the, if we choose the area of 22, you know, direct test, but still if we choose the area of 22, we failed in positive control. If we choose uh, in, uh, again, for quantitative variability test, the wrong area, we, are st we, we still fail. So we really need to be careful to choose the right test. And also regarding the contact area, we found that the best one was 59 for several reasons that I don't want to, you know, speak about because you know, otherwise it becomes too long. So at the end, you know, the contact time doesn't matter at all because it's the less critical factor. And so we had the same result for different area. And at the end, we, we can say that uh, we, we have to use uh, for 24 hours, a contact area of 59%, and this way the, the test is reproducible, reproducible and uh, we have you know, the um, best you know, outcomes in terms of cytotoxicity. Last things that I have also to say that now we are speaking about the H value, but there are many other toxicity um, uh, elements that are very toxic, sometimes even more than the H value. So I mean, something that has to label on our product to be, you know, um, 
safe in terms of, so to be uh, you know really clear in order to choose you know uh, the best for our um, patient so coming back to the starting question why didn't it work for the pfo because they just uh, you know, it's not a problem of this, just they choose the wrong testing method. So they, you know, a method that was uh, unsuitable for, uh, you know, the PFO. And so it was inappropriate. That's why we had the false negative control. And uh, the problem is not ISO itself, but, uh, you know, the test that we, have, we, we are using. So we want all these things labeled on the, our product, you know, to be sure that we are using uh, um, the right one without uh, giving any um, damage, you know, to the patient. So finally, we can say that there is a mixing factor. We have seen silicon oil, we have received the PFO, we have received the interaction between two. So, and um, we want to have, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, a nice and uh, well-controlled compound to use uh, in our surgery, you know, to, be, to get the best outcomes. Thank you.